Whakataka te hau ki te uru, whakataka te hau ki te tonga. Kia mā kina kina ki uta, kia mā taratara ki tai. E hi a ki ana te ātākura, he teo, he huka, he hauhunga. Hau me e hui e tai ki e. Kei ngā hau e whāra rau mai ki te hui. Ko mihi ngā rangi tēnei, e mihi atu nei ki a koutou katoa. Welcome to the hui, Māori current affairs for all New Zealanders. E tarua ke nei. This Queen's birthday weekend, the voice of an angel, the mana of a dame. We reflect on Dame Hinewehi Mohi's defining performance of the national anthem in Te Reo Māori. The enormity of representing our country at that moment was not lost on me, that's for sure. She started the ball rolling that we now accept pretty well across the board now in New Zealand that this is the natural way that we sing our national anthem. And uh, I'm glad she did. And we revisit Bros for Change, the Kaupapa Māori training program, transforming the lives of at-risk rangatahi. You know, this is a chance for them to actually just be a young man, have no pressure and have fun and maybe a new experience. I don't want you to see the things that I've seen and the things that I know in the justice system, corruption system. Tahuti mai. Dame Henewehi Mohi is a singer, a breast cancer survivor, a campaigner and a creative. And now she can add Grand Companion of the New Zealand Order of Merit to her long list of achievements. Today, Dame Henewehi was named in the Queen's Birthday Honours for her services to Māori and music. A journey that began 21 years ago when she took to the stage to sing the national anthem in Te Reo Māori and changed our nation for the better. She's one of our most adored singers. Henewehi Mohi back in the chapel, where her career began at Hato Hohepa Māori Girls College. These young women singing alongside her are too young to remember how she first became a household name. But for Henewehi, the memory hasn't faded. For 19 years, I really avoided it. I knew that it was a part of my backstory that was interesting to people, but because of that hurt and uh, an inability to really understand why anyone could not feel the same love f for our language and culture, that I, um, I guess I had buried it a little bit. The year was 1999. The All Blacks were about to take the field, facing off against England in the quarter-final of the Rugby World Cup. 80,000 spectators had packed out Twickenham Stadium. Millions more tuned in around the world. At the centre of this epic scene, Henewehi Mohi begins to sing. The enormity of representing our country at that moment was not lost on me, that's for sure. And uh, I just um, felt so proud to be there. I, I was really just so determined to do the very best job. Henewehi was in Europe promoting her Reo Māori album Oceania when she was invited to perform our national anthem. She decided to sing it in the language she'd learnt it, Te Reo Māori. She looked so beautiful. I was so proud and had tears in my eyes, actually, watching it, and then she went, Māori order. I went, oh, there's no English. <laughs> OK, kāpai. Keith Quinn remembers watching Henewehe from the commentary box at Twickenham. She was such a wonderful figure of New Zealandness, of Maoriness, that it had a really wonderful effect on me. I thought it'll go on to the English version. And when it didn't, I can remember thinking, hmm, that's going to cause comment. On a high from her international performance, Henewehe was oblivious to the storm brewing back home. 
When did you start to realise that the feedback wasn't so great, that there was a backlash? Um, I, it had been organised for me to do an interview with the late Sir Paul Holmes, but when Paul rang me, he said there's been the most incredible backlash. As the nation watched with pride, Hine Wehe Mohi stood in front of the rugby world and sang our anthem in Māori, no English. And there's an outcry. Talk back goes balmy. Faxes have been pouring in here. I can understand it, Paul, wanting to sing the song from the bottom of the heart. Unfortunately, three million New Zealanders wanted to do exactly the same thing, and we were unable to. Close friend Stacey Morrison recalls watching the Holmes interview. As a friend, I was just so proud, and then to see it all play out like she was some sort of villain, and I could tell she was upset and shocked. And the blows kept coming from all directions. One of the Māori members of the All Black squad said to me, oh, you, you sang the national anthem, didn't you? And I said, yes. He said, it was really wrong what you did. And I, I was you know, further devastated by the fact that he was Māori and hadn't supported the singing of, of the Māori version of the national anthem. If she'd asked them whether she could sing in Māori and indeed asked any of the New Zealand authorities from the New Zealand Rugby Union, they'd have told her no. So uh, g given the place of the Te Reo version of the national anthem in our society now right across the board, she was incredibly courageous to start it all uh, with the singing that day. 20 years on, Henny here can look back at the articles she's kept from the time. Then we all drew breath to show the world how to sing a national anthem. Wrong! <laughs> that silly female sang it in Maori to a deathly hush from some extremely angry New Zealanders. The only sound other than her rather shrill voice was a yell of sing it in English. Did you hear that? No, thank goodness. <laughs> Why do you think you keep them? Hmm, actually that's a good question. It is a little piece of history, my mm. history, and um, even though it had been for a long time painful to read, I can read it now and, and not even cry. <laughs> Hene Wehe now lives in Havelock North with husband George and daughter Henero Katauri, who was just three at the time. Tonight it's Kai with the Cuzzies and her 93 year old grandmother, Joan Mohi. Mm. years on from Heniwehi's game-changing performance, singing the anthem in Te Reo Māori is the new normal in Aotearoa. She started the ball rolling that we now accept pretty well across the board now in New Zealand, that this is the natural way that we sing our national anthem. And uh, I'm glad she did. Heniwehi changed the game, and I've never heard her speak of herself like that and we know. And we actually need to make sure that our tamariki know. I tell my tamariki that. The fire hens did that. Oh, wow, OK. <laughs> Nowadays, the vitriol has been replaced with praise. Heniwehi, a powerful example of what one voice can achieve. A lot of um, Pākehā have come to me and said, it was incredible what you did and made me feel really proud. <laughs> Come in myself, oh, I'm not going to cry. <laughs> Why do you think it's so emotional for you? Oh, I don't even know how to articulate it. I think it just, it really just went right 
into the nitty gritty part of my heart. And so um, to have someone come up to me um, years later and say how much it affected them in a positive way really gives me heart that, that we'll be okay and, and our language will be okay. After the break, we re revisit the Kaupapa Māori initiative, transforming the lives of at-risk youth. There's a saying that it's easier to build strong children than to repair broken men. And that's the philosophy behind a Kaupapa Māori initiative for at-risk youth. Using culture, identity and tikanga, Bros for Change is a unique 20-week programme for rangatahi from intermediate school right through to more serious youth offenders. Last September, the Hui reporter Rowani Pereira went on camp to meet the men behind this transformational project. Mango pare! Mango pare! Mango pare! Rangatahi reconnecting with their inner warrior. Somewhere they still know that they are Māori, but they've lost who they actually are, that, that identity. And this is a chance for them to actually just be a young man, have no pressure and have fun and maybe a new experience. Bros for Change is an alternative education course helping troubled youth become responsible young men. What do I want out of this program of Kaupapa? Man, I want results. That's what I want. I'd like to think that we're going to have amazing growth. I already see, I guess, that word potential in all of them. It's about really unlocking it. For some of these kids, it's a second chance to get their life back on track. I don't want these rangatahi in the system because it's a beast. 
It is a, it is a beast. And a labour of love for the man whose own troubled youth inspired the project. Everyone was like, bro, you can't write a program for vulnerable children when you've been in prison. So my thing was that I wanted to be successful in that just to prove them wrong. It's the dawn of a new day in Kaikoura and new beginnings are on the horizon. At Takahanga Marae, a group of local high school students are gathering. They're the latest intake for Bros for Change, a youth education programme focused on real people, real talk and real change. So at the moment, you, we, with all of you, we all, your trust is all up here. We have fully trust you. The only way you can go down is this. if you muck up, then it comes down, OK? And then you have to rebuild that trust. So uh, we'll treat you as, you know, you're up here. Have a good time. We'll be right. The 20 week program is designed for rangatahi from tough backgrounds. Today, they're heading off to Wainui Valley, where they'll be spending orientation week and meeting Bros for Change founder, Jay Pukepuke. Hey, Atua, Atua. They must form quite a tight bond pretty quickly, right? Yeah, that's the idea. We all sleep in the same place, we eat the same food, we all fart and snore and got stink feet, and you know, you can't help but form a bond and, and build a relationship. This is the start of a six month program. So there's gonna be a lot of things come up and a lot of challenges. So um, we just need to roll with the punches and support each other and make sure we all are sitting here at the end. Ready, ready, one, two. Oh, a former up and coming rugby league star, Jay developed this unique program five years ago with the goal of unlocking the potential in troubled teens. You know, I had opportunity to play rugby league professionally and make heaps of money, but I couldn't because I went to prison. I came here to try and help fellows like yourself, like myself, if there's an opportunity that comes up in life, whatever it may be, that you can then go and do it and not miss out. As a teen, Jay was tipped to achieve big things on the league field, but at just 16, his demons got the better of him. You know, they said a lot of things even when I was young. You know, they labelled me stupid, hoary, you know, they said, you're going to go to jail. And I went to jail and I went, you're right. Jay ended up serving six years in prison for his part in armed robberies. But the experience made him determined to change his life and to help others to do the same. Everyone was like, bro, you can't write a program for vulnerable children when you've been in prison. So my thing was that I wanted to be successful in that just to prove them wrong. Jay couldn't do this without the background and what he's been through. What better tuakana could you ask for? 44-year-old Damien Kamana is the latest member of the Bros for Change team and today is day one in the new job. I don't want you to see the things that I've seen and the things that I know in the justice system, correction system. Damien, too, had a tough upbringing, growing up in a home where domestic violence was the norm. We had a very dysfunctional family. As long as I can remember, my, um, my mother was, was abused. She was exposed to a lot of violence, a lot of drugs, a lot of alcohol, um, different men in and out of our lives, had no father figure. And he found himself treating his wife the same way his mother had been. My mother always thought that I'd never do anything like that. And I told her, well, I did. And pretty hard probably owning, owning that and pretty hard telling my mother that as well. But through his work rehabilitating offenders, Damien began to understand his own behaviour because essentially I was sitting with men that were perpetrators of family violence. I knew I was exactly the same. So over the last four and a half years, I, I guess I've learned a lot, a lot about myself. 
and these experiences are used as teachable moments for the boys. We all have a story of some sort. All those stories will come out over the next six months when appropriate to keep these boys on track, motivated and going in the right direction. The aim of the course is simple, getting kids outdoors and keeping them out of jail. Māori under 18 year olds now make up a larger proportion of those taken into police custody. All right, we're going to play a game. You have to be in this area. I'll give you a minute and I'll turn around and I don't want to see anyone. While it might look like pure entertainment, the activities are all designed to improve behaviours, like increasing their self-esteem and confidence. Oh, I can't see anyone. And this is a chance for them to actually just be a young man and um, have no pressure and have fun and maybe a new experience. Do you see yourself in some of those boys? Oh, all of them. Uh, you know, there's potential in all of them, that famous word potential, but whether we use it or not. Hopefully they can start from a level playing field rather than having to come out of a hole like, like we did. After the break, the key role Matauranga Māori plays in restoring the boys' self-belief. Think about what your ancestors gave up for you guys to be here right now. Your tikuna gave up a lot for you to be here right now. Araki Mai Ano. Growth for Change is an alternative education program that's achieving an 89% success rate for Rangatahi. The project creator says they're saving taxpayers around a million dollars a year and keeping young men out of the criminal justice system. Bros for Change encourages Rangatahi to get out of their comfort zone. This 17-metre high swing isn't just a thrill ride, it's a chance to challenge themselves 
to dig deep. Scared me <laughs> very, very good. Yeah, giant swing. I knew it would be something that would put the boys in a situation where they would have to really search for courage and working outside of their comfort zone. <laughs> You go through all these emotions in your head and it's you battling it and you want to give up. Go to the top, Angel. Nah. Yeah. I'm only going to go up like, just a little bit. But if you yeah, just on. push that barrier... Two, one. Oh, <laughs> ...then it's worth it. A sense of achievement. It's a small win. <laughs> if you do it once, then you know you can push again. It's installing more belief. Just as important as this test of mental strength is teaching the boys basic life skills. Like waking up bright and early. For a week, they wake up at 6.30 and they train every day, all day. The idea behind it was that if you're young and you've got no skills and no qualifications, usually the type of job you may get requires you to start really early. And just as vital, how to cook a meal. So tonight we're making nachos. So it's real easy. While serving his jail sentence, Jay Pukepuke worked in the prison kitchen. Always keep your eyes on the knife at all times, all right? All times. <laughs> I always wanted to be a chef. Did a bit of an apprenticeship and then did the theory side and then worked as a chef. I think that was the start of, you know, when I started having self-belief. Is, is when I wanted to do something, I could do it. And I was like, hey, I'm not stupid. I think that translated into other things in my life. I carried that on and things got bigger and bigger and bigger, including, you know, this programme. It's the Matauranga Māori elements of the programme that are truly life-changing for these young men. The idea of standing up and giving your pepiha is to connect with people in the room, but it's actually also to gloat about who you are. If we can give these guys their identity and know their whakapapa and where they actually come from and who they actually are, I think that's important because they need to keep that. We should never lose it. Today, they're learning the traditional art of Morako, Māori weaponry. Developing their discipline strength and identity. The more energy you put into this, boys, the better you're going to feel. The whole program's based on kaupapa Māori and in te ao Māori, the Māori world. Small things without shoving it down their throat all helps. as all foundations to build on, yeah. Mato. And those Mato. foundations can lead Māori. to big things. An independent study of the programme found that culturally based learning resulted in significant behavioural changes in Rangatahi, improving their attendance and engagement at school. Jay believes a stronger connection to his culture may have prevented him from going to jail. You were ashamed of being Māori? Yeah. My grandfather is Tuhoi. It's only two years ago I went to his marae. So going back to Tuhoi and meeting the family and visiting all where my grandfather went was just, you know, putting more of me back together. They need to know who they are, not be embarrassed of anything. This is all things you're trying to do. Despite being just 15% of the general population, Māori are more than 50% of all prisoners. And that's part of the motivation for ensuring the Bros for Change programme is accessible to kids who need it, free of charge. If we charge all the families, we would have no kids. We don't want to do that. We want to charge the government. 
<laughs> I mean, you could give us, you know, 10% of what it costs for to hold them in prison for a year with better outcomes, you know. Finally, after five years of hard slog, Bros for Change has been recognised for its remarkable results. <laughs> receiving half a million dollars from the government to get more rangatahi into training and employment. Has it been tough for you to get that recognition? Yeah, to start with, to start with, but no one wanted to be the first to jump in and say, yeah, we'll back you, because we were just a big risk. The idea was we just wanted to help people. And I think, well, it's working, isn't it? In fact, it's working so well, their Timatanga Ho programme is booked out until 2022. My favourite highlight so far is probably the swing. Yeah. The final evening at camp and the boys reflect on the week's highs and lows. What do I want out of this programme? Oh, memories and tight connection with the boys. Oh. Get an eight pack. Yeah. Get muscles. We're in the dugout with them at the moment, eh? So they see us as equal and someone they can trust and someone they can talk to. And that's the whole idea. What are you prepared to change to move forward? You know, that conversations and communication are the two key things to stop anyone from making a bad decision. The boys have made it through orientation week, the first step towards realising their potential and a better future. Are you excited to see where these guys end up in 20 weeks? I am. I have visions of them standing there in 20 weeks in a nice shirt and being proud of what they've achieved with a full CV. I feel like some will be in full-time employment and really equipped with more life skills and experiences and some built resilience to cope with things that will come up in their life. And they will come up. It's never too late. You can do whatever you want. And that's what we're projecting onto the kids. Kei runga no atu koutou. Ko hiki na te hui mō tēnei rā e huama no horo mai rā. with support from New Zealand On Air.